Good morning, everyone. Start with the announcements. We have our ladies' tea Saturday, May 6th, here at the church at 2 p.m. I think that's this Saturday. So, um, I mean, I won't be there, but we look forward to having y'all come. <laughs> Uh, and then we also have the church barbecue here at the church Sunday, May 28th. I think that's the Sunday before Memorial Day. Uh, so that'll be after the morning service. The church will provide meat, buns, and water. Please bring a side dish, salad, dessert, or other drinks, or just yourself if you can't bring anything. So we just look forward to seeing everybody there. Are there any other special announcements? All right, then I will read the call to worship, which is Psalm 122, verses 1 to 9. A song of ascents of David. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For thrones are set there for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say peace be within you. Because of the house of the Lord, our God, I will seek your good. And I will pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Sunday that we can come together to worship you as a church family. Lord, we thank you that we can come uh, into this house of worship and uh, that we are all glad to be here. We thank you that we have the freedom to do this. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you would bless us today, that you would bless our worship, that you would guide us as we come before you to praise you through song, through the message, and through fellowship. We pray that if there's anything that's hindering our worship, Lord, that you would take it away and help us to be able to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray that we would look forward to the culmination of our salvation and the return of Jesus Christ to this earth to make all things right, to make all things new, and to take us to be with you forever, to worship you in perfect holiness. We wait for this day, Lord. We pray that you would help us to be patient and to be faithful until then, uh, and that we would continue to to worship you in a way that's pleasing to you until that day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. in 
the light of His glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, He promised. Believe Him and always be well. Then go to a Lord that is dying, His perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look for in His wonderful And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Amen. All right, then over to hymn number 356, Near to the Heart of God. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place we sin cannot molest near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, bless Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, all past to wait before thee, me to the heart of God. There is a place of comfort sweet, me to the heart of God, a place where we our Savior meet, meet to the heart of God. O oh, Jesus, bless Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, all those who went before thee, meet to the heart of God. There is a place of holy release me to the heart of God, a place with holy joy and peace me to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, bless me. From the heart of God, all past to wait before thee, me to the heart of God. Amen. Thank you for your singing. So, Pastor Martin will come at this time and minister to us. He doesn't need any introduction. He's been here a few times, and so we know him. How are we doing? Good. We'll give you another test at the end of the sermon, see if we're still doing okay. Huh? Well, I got thinking on my way driving up here today that uh, I've been doing this for a while. I first started communicating with Wesley Clem someplace about the, uh, oh, I think 1966 area. Yeah, at least it's not. Yeah, I had red hair. It was curly and everything. It'd be scary if I showed up that way now. Yeah. Then uh, made a trip out here in 1969. Wesley and Joanne were so kind. 
put me up in their, their home. Debbie was about like this at that time. In 1970, my wife and I came out here to kind of scout it out together. And in 1971, in, in May, about, oh, I don't know, about two or three weeks from now back then, we, uh, we actually moved into to Utah and became the associate pastor here for about a year and a half. Wow. Well, we moved out here with everything we owned in a U-Haul trailer, pulled behind a 1968 repainted Chevy. <laughs> Oh, man, I got a real good introduction to Utah. On, on the way across the, the border of, of Wyoming and Utah, my muffler fell off. Welcome to Utah. Then uh, just to make sure that uh, I knew where I was, uh, I, you know, the Lord's in control, but somehow you know that he lets the devil get away with a few things for some reason. Uh, I went to Sears. That, you remember Sears? That used to be a, a store that we used to go to, right? It was just down the street here, even then, and so I, I, I went, maybe this one was, I don't know, maybe this was the one downtown. Anyway, I was down there getting a new muffler. While I was parked in the parking lot, somebody ran into my car. <laughs> Welcome to Utah. I have had this theory since that day, that if there were only two cars on the road in Utah, they would run into each other. And probably one of them would still be in a driveway. But I love living in Utah. Having said that, I, I love living here. I got, I got rear-ended a few years ago. I, I stopped for a red light, so I got rear-ended. <laughs> I asked the guy, what happened? He said, I thought you were going through the light. I said, it was red. So what's the point? <laughs> enough stories. Enough stories. Uh, so, I want to talk to you today about something very, very basic. Sometimes we need to get back to basics. I don't know if the most basic way of describing our responsibility spiritually under the creative hand of Almighty God would be to understand this that there is one true God and it is our duty to be properly related to him. Now we could add a lot of things to that, obviously. Properly related to him presupposes a relationship with Christ. You know, there are a lot of so-called gods out there, right? I've traveled very little, been to your part of the world. Boy, that's a different part of the world. People there have a different concept of God. But they believe in some kind of God. On that trip, I mean, I, I saw modern examples of that, different concepts of God. I saw archaeological evidences of that. Apollo, Athena, Artemis, you know. Gods. But there is one true God. He has a name. He has many names. But still one true God. Uh, n names mean something. Sometimes names are a little uh, confusing, though. For instance, I, got, I have a wonderful older sister. I have two sisters. They're both wonderful. But I have one who's older and one who's older, older. I'm the baby in the family. Yeah, it's hard to imagine I was ever a baby. But my, my oldest sister, for some reason... Uh, I think I understand a little bit of the reasoning because I think I know the family history a little bit enough to figure this out. But this cute little baby girl was named Gertrude Agnes. Why would you do that to a cute little baby girl? Oh, 
I love my mom to this day. She's, she's in heaven now. But I think she had a very dear aunt in Canada named either Gertrude or Agnes. I, uh... But, you know, th th then my, my, my sister has a little bit of responsibility in this naming business. She went out and married a Dutchman by the name of Nevelizer. So Gertrude Agnes Nevelizer. So we call her Peggy. <laughs> and she liked that just fine. I don't think of her as Gertrude. Uh, I think of her as Peggy. But when I think of her, I think of Peggy for who she is, this wonderful sister of mine. I don't know why you have named your children what you have named your children. Uh, maybe you're, you still have some naming to do left in your future as, as uh, you sometimes have that responsibility. I don't know what you're going to do. Maybe you're going to go get one of those books. Babies' names. Yeah. I, I am told that these days, the two most popular birth names out there, this surprised me. I never would have guessed these two names. Olivia and Oliver. Somebody's really into olives. They must be Middle Eastern. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. Olivia and Oliver. Well, there's a lot in a name, I guess. For some reason, people choose the names they do. But there's a reason why the names for God are what they are. They are very descriptive. Uh, and that's the way it is with names. Uh, whether human names... Oh, by the way, animals. When we moved to Utah, we came out here with, with a cat. We had a six-month-old boy and a cat about the same age named Dingling. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, there was a reason why that cat was named Dingling. Right? Now, when, when you talk about the names of God, descriptive to the max. The, the biblical names for God tells us who he actually is, and understanding these descriptions are essential if we are to avoid worshiping a false god. Uh, people are, are, are very naive, thinking that because somebody worships God, somebody else worships God, somebody worships somebody called Jesus, or we worship somebody called Jesus, that well, we're all just kind of in this together. No, not necessarily at all. First uh, Corinthians 8, verses 5 and 6. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we are, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. Uh, depending on how you define what a name is, some people say there are at least seven divine names. Others say, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. There are as many as 952 names for God. Well, the big difference in that number is whether you're going to include his titles and descriptions as names. Uh, this is not just what I hope to be an interesting study. It's directly connected to our spiritual condition, even our eternal destiny. It's that important. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 7, one of the Ten Commandments. I, I tell you, we're getting back to basics here, right? No pun intended, when you talk about the Ten Commandments, you're talking about bedrock truth, carved in stone. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. That is just so abused. So often. We hear it all the time. Listen, I'm, for illustrative purposes... I will say some things that 
I recommend and implore us to not do in practice, all right? We should never, as a course of habit, just say, oh my God. Never. That's to trivialize the name of God. Now, I'm old. You can just tell that by looking at me. Man, am I old. But when I was growing up, there, there were even people preaching at me, be very careful about minced oaths. What do they mean by that? Well, instead of saying, oh my God, saying, oh my gosh. You know what? I don't think that was being too picky. You know, saying, "Jeez." That's taking the Lord's name in vain. Sort of, kind of. I would be real careful about that. Because of what I just read. The Lord, the one true God, will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. I, I want to be on the safe side of that one as much as I possibly can. Well, it can even be done in a religious context. Just trivializing the name of God without speaking reverently of him. Jesus said in John chapter 17 and verse 3, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And one of the portals of understanding of the truth about who God is are the names that he has caused to be revealed in descriptions of himself. I did not bring my PowerPoint stuff with me today or I would be able to illustrate some of this. I would like you to um, think about this name for God today. Yahweh. Uh, if you're spelling it with English letters, Y-A-H-W-E-H. -E That's how we do it in English. Now, the Hebrew equivalent of that is quite different, and I'll explain how, how different it is and what that does for our understanding. Now, Moses learned that that was God's name. Moses learned that in Exodus chapter 3. Now, some of you are wondering, how come he keeps jumping around? This is a jumping around sermon. That's not my favorite kind of sermon all the time. But once in a while, we're going to pull some things together from more than one portion of Scripture. Okay? Today we do that. Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Moses said to God, and now this is after God tapped him on the shoulder. God tapped Moses on the shoulder. said, I want you to lead my people out of Egypt uh, into a promised land. I want you to be the leader. Well, Moses is saying, you've got to be kidding, or some version of that, right? You, not me. I can't do this. For one thing, he said, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? In other words, who gave you the right to act like you're supposed to be our boss? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name. What is, this is what name? I am. Or Yahweh. I am. This is my name forever. And, and uh, this is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Okay, so that's what we're doing today. This is one of those generations. 
We're to be remembering that forever. His name, Yahweh. The essence of his name is this. When you think about God as the I am. It sounds a little weird at first. How could that be a name? That's weird. I am. No, it's not weird. It's, it's perfect. Because this speaks of uncreated unsourced. Uh, I am is a constant, constant, unchanging, you see. And, and unending. It has to do with the uncreated creator. It has to do with self-existence. That's God. Where did God come from? He didn't. That's the answer to that question. He has always been. And God is not getting any better. He's always been perfect as perfect can be. He defines perfection. He is the standard of it. He is the author and the sustainer of life. If that doesn't spell get on your knees, I don't know what does. Without him, we would have no ground to stand on or air to breathe. We would have not an instant more of life if it were not for him being the source of it. We better take him seriously, right? He's Yahweh. The one true God Almighty. Psalm 90 and verse 2. Before the mountains out, out here, what gorgeous now, I, I've never gotten over this. I look out my front door or my windows on the east side of my house, and I look across the veil, there they are. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That's our God. Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Now, everything else you know about Changes, right? Except for God and his word, everything is changing. Go by a junkyard someday and try to compute how many people's heart were broken after they spent all of those months paying off those vehicles. Now there they are collecting rust. (laughs) James chapter 1 and verse 17 Every good and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation. God has never changed his mind about anything. He's never had to. He never changes. Hey, guys, it's not just the women who change their mind about things. We're all changeable, ridiculously changeable and inconsistent. By the way, if if you want to eliminate as much inconsistency as possible in life, just be as biblical as possible because God's word doesn't change. Otherwise, you'd be in this constant bouncing around from this idea to the other idea. So... Here's the thing about the name Yahweh that I wanted to share with you right now. And that is the Hebrews had this very interesting way of speaking and writing. Of course, foreign languages are foreign to everybody else except the one who grew up with that particular language group. 
So we may or may not understand somebody speaking in a language that we did not originally grow up with. I think some people are very blessed to grow up in a bilingual or multilingual situation. It's a lot easier to learn that stuff when you're you know, younger. But the Hebrew language had its way of being spoken, but when they wrote it, they had no vowels. All consonants. That's odd. <laughs> I don't, I'm not a linguist enough to know if there are other languages like that or not. Languages are very interesting things. There are tonal languages and all kinds of languages. But we have, therefore, no idea how the name Yahweh would have been pronounced. And complicating that whole situation, even though there is no prohibition in the word of God itself about speaking the name for God, they didn't. So that's the other reason why it's hard to determine how they might have said it if they wanted to say it but didn't anyway. Uh, so we, we have to guess. We, we, we have the consonants for the name of God. And they would turn out in English to be Y-H-W-H. How do you pronounce Y-H-W-H? Your guess is as good as anybody else's. Um, I, I, know, I noticed as we were singing the songs today, well, not the songs so much, is, is, is the, the call to worship, the scripture up there, Psalm 122, uh, from the New King James Version. I happen to be using uh, the New English Version for my, my text today. But uh, uh, most English translations, as far as I know, all English translations, uh, when translating the Old Testament scriptures, when they come to this divine name, use all caps for Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's how this Yahweh concept is translated into English Bibles. There's a reason why it's all caps. Maybe you didn't notice that before, but most of you probably knew that anyway. Uh, then you have other things like G-O-D, capital G, small O, small D, uh, is the word for Elohim. We won't get into that today. But then you can come up with a, a familiar verse like this. Know that the Lord, all caps, Yahweh. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made, it's this one who made us. Yeah, there, there, there are gods all over the place ancient and modern. But know that Yahweh, he is God. It is he, it's that one who made us, not any other. Now that went over like a lead balloon in that part of the world when it was first announced. Because Israel was surrounded by very strong nations who had totally different concepts of deities. And they still do. You know, you can believe in almost anything you want to believe in as long as you don't begin to suggest that what somebody else believes isn't right. <laughs> Being exclusive about truth has always been unpopular. It's really unpopular these days. Okay, you say, oh, well, listen, I, where does this concept then of, I've heard the, the name Jehovah. Where does that come from? Glad you asked. Good question. How does that fit into this discussion today? Well, the Hebrew scriptures at a point in time was translated into Latin, as has been translated into a lot of different languages. Uh, for a long time, Latin was kind of like a universal scripture language, you know. Talk about the Roman Empire, the Roman period, Latin was it in the Roman Empire. Uh, so, when they got to this 
Jeho to this Yahweh business when translating into Latin, the Latinized version of Yahweh turns out to be J H V H. Is kind of the way you would put it into English letters from the Latin. And so J H V H, how do you say that? Well, that's where the concept of Jehovah has come into the picture, trying to, sub, trying to supply some vowels to connect all of those consonants and make it pronounceable or something you could spell out and recognize a little more readily. But however you want to pronounce this, Yahweh, Jehovah, our relationship with this God is infinitely more important than knowing the correct pronunciation of his Hebrew name. I know we have people running around our neighborhood sometimes knocking on our doors telling us they are witnesses of Jehovah and making a really big deal about that and not a very accurate presentation of that. But listen, his name is what we've talked about. And he is who he says he is. And somebody trying to convince us otherwise, it just doesn't make any difference. He is who he is. So let's see who he is on display. Some examples of Yahweh and his deeds in his pronouncements, Old Testament scriptures here. Exodus chapter 34. Yahweh on display. 34 verses 4 through 7. Okay, so Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first. This is kind of Ten Commandments 202. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first. And he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended, that is Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood with him and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord, this is Yahweh, passed before him and proclaimed the Lord. The Lord. And then these words, and just bathe yourselves in the truth of these words. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. You want to know what Yahweh is like? That's what Yahweh is like. And we should be eternally grateful that he is the God of forgiveness. You know, I have found that I get along with almost anybody in the world except perfect people. I do not do well with perfect people. I guess it's because I don't have a whole lot in common with them. But for those of us who aren't perfect, even though God hates sin, He is Yahweh, the forgiving God. So there is hope. Oh, I know God gets a bad name from some people, especially the Old Testament scriptures, thinking, oh man, you read all those scriptures where this nation and that nation came under divine judgment. Well, listen, we deserve that too. 
It's not that God did a bad thing when he judged the nations. The amazing thing is that he would accept any of us. And the only way he does that is by infinite divine forgiveness. Okay. 1 Samuel 2 and verse 2. There is none holy like Yahweh. So it says. For there is none beside you, there is no rock like our God. Yahweh is holy, and he's called a rock. His holiness is his essence. What is holiness? I said before, he is the very essence and definition of perfection. Holiness means perfect, total absence of sin, or the, even the possibility of it. Arguing with God is about the dumbest thing we could do, because the very fact that God would say or do anything means that it is perfect, because that's all he's capable of doing. So we have to adjust our idea of what is right and what is wrong to match with whatever we find that he is or has done or has said. That's Yahweh, holy. At, holy is not a relative term. It is a term of absoluteness. Daniel chapter 9 and verse number 4. Another example of Yahweh on display. Daniel said, I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession. Well, that's a pretty good thing to do. Daniel prayed to Yahweh and made confession saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Much to appreciate about these words, but a concept here that I want us to remember about Yahweh is it says he is the one who keeps covenant. Covenant is a promise. God has never made a promise that he has not or will not keep. Have you ever been disappointed by people? Of course. That's a bitter experience when perhaps you have invested your total self in transparent vulnerability toward another human being and they threw it right in your face. Oh, that's painful. God will never do that and never has with anybody. Maybe you're in a position today where you are about to give up on people and give up on life, and that's a dangerous position to be in with potentially tragic consequences. Well, this is the time to flee to God quickly. You can put your entire trust in him. Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse number 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear, for it is Yahweh, your God, who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. My dear sister, I don't know what you're going through physically. 
But we'll pray that the Lord will somehow give direction to figure out what the problem is so a solution can be found. When you go into a, a lab and some machine surrounds you and makes weird sounds, and makes clicks, and they say, don't move now. You know? So you close your eyes because you don't want to see how close it is to your face. Been there and done all that. I like verses like this. I, I'm, you know, I have the courage quotient of wobbly jello. So I need to be encouraged because I don't seem to have a whole lot of it innately. So I like a verse that says, be strong and courageous, do not fear, for it is the Lord your God. The, the creator God of all the universe who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you, even through this ridiculous test that they're putting me through right now. Well, you know, that's half the Bible right there, the Old Testament. The New Testament, is, is there any reference to Yahweh in the New Testament? Oh, yeah. I just don't have a whole long time to, to say this, other than say this. The greatest display of Yahweh in the New Testament, you already know the answer to this. The greatest display of Yahweh in the New Testament is this, from John chapter 8, beginning in verse 54. Jesus answered to a hostile crowd, by the way. Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me of whom you say he is our God, but you do not know him. I know him. If I were to say I do not know him, I would be a liar like you, but I, I do know him and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Was that just a coincidence that he said that? You know, the people got the point, and they got the point quickly because it says, so they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Yes, the greatest demonstration of Yahweh is Jesus. Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh. And he is my Savior. So my prayer for us today as we conclude our study is a familiar prayer from the lips of Jesus himself. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 9. Jesus said, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven Hallowed be your name. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for revealing yourself to us so beautifully and clearly in Scripture. And I do pray today, as we have gathered here, that those who know you would be drawn closer to you than than we have been before. It's just to be reminded of who you are, how wonderful you are. 
Father, I concur with the author that I read a while back who said that the God of the Bible is worthy to be known and made known just for who he is. And Lord, if there are those gathered here today who have yet to come to a perfect, uh, uh, a saving knowledge of who you are, that this would be the day of coming to faith in Christ for that person. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. The apostle wrote, as well as having spoken it himself, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, may this be a day where you would be glorified because indeed, you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Whoever's going to close, this is the time to do your thing. Thank you, Pastor Larkin. We appreciate you coming and ministering to us. In number 318, I need thee every hour. I need thee every hour.